Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Sophie Louie. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with the impact of the pandemic in Canada, the fourth wave pushing hospitals to the brink, particularly in Alberta. That province leads the way by far with the highest number of active cases across the country, but Saskatchewan is in crisis as well. Saskatchewan has the highest rate of deaths in the country in the last seven days and the highest rate of new cases of any province in the last week. The Saskatchewan government still hasn't officially asked Ottawa to help with record levels of COVID-19. Today, the province activated its emergency operations centre to lead its response to the fourth wave. But as Connor O'Donovan reports, it's not clear exactly how that will help meet the most urgent needs. Is there an opportunity for us to even look deeper within our province as to are there, uh, you know, ways to support um, our frontline staff, in particular those that are working in our ICU departments? Thursday morning, Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe announced a new command team that he says will streamline emergency response to the pandemic. It includes members from the Health Authority, the Ministry of Health and the Saskatchewan Public Safety Agency, which typically responds to things like floods and wildfires, though it has helped move personnel like nurses around the province since the pandemic began. This is not a takeover. This is just a changing of a structure going into a unified command instead of us being a uh, kind of a support role. The changeup comes during a week in which hospitalization records were broken four days in a row. Right now there are a record 78 people in ICU with COVID-19 and 270 more in inpatient care, down from a record 280 on Wednesday. The province has already slowed down 275 health care services to accommodate up to 125 ICU and 350 the inpatients, but exactly how this new organization will further increase capacity seems still to be determined. Using the, the absolutely fantastic skills that my staff have, we will be able to see benefits very quickly and hopefully those will be around those resourcing. Some Saskatchewan doctors, meanwhile, say it's restrictions that are needed right now, not management restructuring, in particular limits on gathering sizes. Those restrictions have worked. We had them in place in previous waves, which had helped us to perhaps come through those waves uh, faster. The healthcare system is completely collapsed and all of our best people, the people that we need to look after the sickest individuals in our province, they're completely tapped out. Mo did say Thursday that nothing is off the table right now, including asking the federal government for aid. I think that's a daily conversation uh, that has been occurring is, uh, you know, uh, you know, what can the federal government provide and, uh, and, and at what point do we do we do we want those provisions? And and we may in the next number of days uh, make make that formal request. Connor Donovan, Global News, Regina. Newfoundland and Labrador has launched its vaccine passport system. The new mobile app will be available to download free tomorrow and goes into effect October 22nd. Proof of full vaccination will come in the form of a QR code. It will be required to enter places like bars, restaurants and gyms. But schools, retail shops and banks will be exempt. Canada's small and medium-sized businesses are waiting for the federal government to announce an extension to pandemic benefits. Wage and rent subsidy programs are set to expire in three weeks. They can be extended until mid-November, but anything beyond that will need parliamentary approval. As Mike Lecouture reports, that's leaving some businesses worried about the months ahead. Now we're... Hello, <laughs> on the other side of the room. The Hi. pandemic has changed how Devinder Kerr runs her yoga center. Physical distancing and provincial rules mean she can only have 50% of her clients in her studio, but she still has to pay 100% of salaries and rent. It's hard to continue to operate and generate, well, <laughs> anywhere near the kind of revenue we used to be able to generate pre-COVID. Kerr has leaned on federal benefits like the wage and rent subsidy programs, which are set to expire in less than three weeks. Wednesday, Finance Minister Christopher Freeland said the government is considering extending benefits, promising continued support for hard-hit sectors. Tourism and events are some examples, and so we are working on ways to ensure that support is there for them. Businesses need specifics to plan ahead. Both the wage and rent subsidy programs can be extended by cabinet until the end of November. But beyond that, it would require new legislation introduced before parliament. 
And there's no sense of when this minority House of Commons is coming back. We urge the Prime Minister to recall Parliament quickly so we can pass fresh legislation to allow for these subsidies and other supports to be put in place to help get us through what we expect to be very lean months uh, over the winter. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh says his party's support for an extension has conditions. The support should go to people for sure and to small businesses. They've been the hardest hit and we don't want to see support continue for the large corporations that have been able to get through this time with, uh, in fact, doing really well. Devinder Kerr has tried to remain Zen through 19 months of lockdowns and capacity limits, but she needs more than promises to keep her doors open. It's great to say, you know, hey, we've got your back. Well, please show me. And until the benefits are extended, Kerr has no choice but to keep her business model flexible. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. Is there an opportunity for us to even look deeper within our province as to are there, uh, you know, ways to support um, our frontline staff, in particular those that are working in our ICU departments? Thursday morning, Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe announced a new command team that he says will streamline emergency response to the pandemic. It includes members from the Health Authority, the Ministry of Health and the Saskatchewan Public Safety Agency, which typically responds to things like floods and wildfires, though it has helped move personnel like nurses around the province since the pandemic began. This is not a takeover. This is just a changing of a structure going into a unified command instead of us being a uh, kind of a support role. The changeup comes during a week in which hospitalization records were broken four days in a row. Right now there are a record 78 people in ICU with COVID-19 and 270 more in inpatient care, down from a record 280 on Wednesday. The province has already slowed down 275 health care services to accommodate up to 125 ICU and 350 the inpatients, but exactly how this new organization will further increase capacity seems still to be determined. Using the, the absolutely fantastic skills that my staff have, we will be able to see benefits very quickly and hopefully those will be around those resourcing. Some Saskatchewan doctors, meanwhile, say it's restrictions that are needed right now, not management restructuring, in particular limits on gathering sizes. Those restrictions have worked. We had them in place in previous waves, which had helped us to perhaps come through those waves uh, faster. The healthcare system is completely collapsed and all of our best people, the people that we need to look after the sickest individuals in our province, they're completely tapped out. Mo did say Thursday that nothing is off the table right now, including asking the federal government for aid. I think that's a daily conversation uh, that has been occurring is, uh, you know, uh, you know, what can the federal government provide and, uh, and, and at what point do we do we do we want those provisions? And and we may in the next number of days uh, make make that formal request. Connor Donovan, Global News, Regina. A former U.S. Army private who revealed state secrets to WikiLeaks is fighting to be allowed into Canada. Chelsea Manning is appearing virtually in front of the Immigration and Refugee Board for an admissibility hearing. The Canadian government is seeking to permanently ban her from entering the country on the grounds of serious criminality. Chelsea Manning was convicted in the U.S. of violating the Espionage Act for leaking hundreds of thousands of classified documents to WikiLeaks. Record-setting food prices. Coming up, what's fueling the rising cost of living in Canada? Plus, British businesses battle severe staff shortages. The ripple effect across the UK. Well, there are more signs today. The cost of living is rising sharply. World food prices reached a 10-year peak in September, driven by the price of grains and vegetable oils. According to the Food Price Index, which tracks the cost of the most globally traded food commodities, food prices jumped more than 32% last month from the same time last year. Vegetable oils saw the steepest rise, 60% higher than September of 2020. Grain prices soared by more than 27%. Sugar, meat and dairy prices also saw a significant rise over the last year. On top of the higher food costs, Canadians should brace for another bill to get bigger this fall and winter. And Gaviola has more on why heating costs are set to rise as the mercury drops. As economies reopen around the world, demand for natural gas has come roaring back, but supply can't keep up. We've been caught off guard a little bit by the pace of the global economic recovery. 
Now, the good news is that Canada's situation isn't as dire as what's happening in Europe, where natural gas prices are surging out of control and creating a crisis. But it's still cause for concern. Wherever you live, you can expect to pay more. Fortis Energy, BC's biggest nat gas distributor, says the majority of its customers could see monthly bills go up by $8. In Ontario, Enbridge says most customers can expect an increase between $7 and $44 a year. And Manitoba Hydro says average annual bills will go up by nearly 9%. For higher volume customers, closer to 20%. And the colder it gets this winter, the harder this will hit. With demand raising natural gas prices, as with oil, it affects the cost of manufacturing and transport, which increases consumer costs for, well, just about everything. And low-income households, the ones already living paycheck to paycheck, are the least able to cope. These households are faced with this trade-off between paying down their energy bills versus uh, paying for their necessities of life, such as... uh, the food, clothing, and shelter. Economists worry about stagflation, the dreaded combination of high inflation plus high unemployment and slow economic growth, meaning higher energy prices could set back economic recovery, even as it boosts the fortunes of some industries. If you're an energy producer, uh, in the case of Alberta, Newfoundland, and, and some other parts of Canada, um, it is a bit of a boon because it does help on the production side. A warming sector that risks leaving some out in the cold. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Still ahead, Brexit plus a pandemic has Britain struggling to fill labour demands. Early morning confusion in Pakistan. A 5.9 magnitude earthquake rattling a remote southwestern region of the country. At least 23 people are dead. Another 200 have been injured, with the most seriously hurt being airlifted to larger centres. The quake bringing down mud homes and collapsing a coal mine. Officials expect the death toll to rise once more help arrives. And some frayed nerves in Tokyo. A 5.9 magnitude earthquake shaking buildings and forcing residents out into the streets. The late night quake also knocked out power to more than 250 homes and shut down a major railway station in the city. Luckily, no major damage has been reported and no tsunami warnings were issued. In the UK, the army has been brought in to help deliver fuel to desperate gas stations. Chicken and beer are in short supply and many supermarket shelves are empty. As Redmond Shannon reports, the supply chain issues come down to a labour shortage, only partially due to the pandemic. They say the British love to join a lineup, and it's just as well these days. Nothing we can do about it, we just need to wait. These gas shortages are not caused by shortages of gas, but by a lack of truck drivers to deliver it. Even the British Army have been drafted in to help. Don't know whose fault it is. I really, really don't. I just find it crazy that things like this can happen. I just think it's ridiculous. The UK's trucking industry says it needs 100,000 new drivers, but a new temporary visa scheme saw just 127 applications from foreign workers. What that shows is the global shortage. There are worker shortages across Europe, but the UK seems to be hit the hardest. Bars and restaurants are struggling to find staff too. Even farms don't have the workers they need. I'm hearing of shortages as much as 40% on some farms, and many growers having to prioritise to decide which crop to pick and which to leave. Some pork farmers are culling pigs due to a shortage of meat processors and shoppers are seeing the consequences on empty shelves. The pandemic spurred thousands of foreign low-paid workers to leave. Experts say the end of free movement into the UK after Brexit is the reason so few are returning. We might just end up, frankly, not producing as many chicken parts as we used to. I don't quite know where it is going to settle, but you can't take a great chunk of the less skilled workforce out and think that you're going to carry on doing exactly the same. Economist Alan Winters says parts of Prime Minister Boris Johnson's rushed EU trade deal to get Brexit done were short-sighted. Johnson insists Britain's economy needs to be rebuilt, but that shortages could continue for some time. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. 
Next, the Canadians who used pencil, ink, and razor-sharp wit to create honor-worthy cartoons. I, I, I never thought I'd hear myself saying this, but, you know, it's an absolute honor to be walked all over in Hollywood, so... Um. <laughs> Daniel Craig now has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The Bond actor's name is emblazoned on the sidewalk at 7007 Hollywood Boulevard. Craig has been playing the legendary British spy for the past 15 years. His fifth and final Bond film, No Time to Die, hits Canadian theaters tomorrow. Also tomorrow, Canada Post will be releasing five new stamps, paying tribute to some of the nation's top editorial cartoonists. Each stamp is quintessentially Canadian, just like the artists they're honouring. And as Mike Armstrong reports, the collection is drawing attention to the role this rare craft plays in our culture. If you're doing something you love, it tends not to feel like work. Well, Terry Mosher's on five decades and counting, living that life as an editorial cartoonist and figures he's been pretty lucky. There may be 15 people in Canada who make a living at it. There are more heart surgeons than there are political cartoonists. He has drawn more than 14,000 cartoons. Now, Mosher is better known under his pen name, Aislinn, and longevity isn't what he should be known for. He's a legend in his field and one of just five editorial cartoonists Canada Post is honoring with their own stamps. There's Brian Gable of the Globe and Mail, the Chronicle Herald's Bruce McKinnon, Serge Chapleau of La Presse, and the late Duncan McPherson of the Toronto Star. These guys are five of Canada's greatest editorial cartoonists, award-winning Order of Canada uh, recipients. Yeah, these guys are, are, are beyond reproach. Now, it isn't about laughs. A lot of times, the topics they tackle are touchy, delicate, even painful. What they seek to add to a newspaper is satire, and often a different way to look at something everyone's talking about. You know, reporters have to report the actual news, and commentators have to be very careful. We don't. We draw what we feel in our gut. Sometimes uh, you actually go further than people are comfortable with. I do. I have to want to keep my editors on their toes. <laughs> Of course, choosing cartoons for the stamps was a challenge. Each of the artists has decades of work and thousands and thousands of pieces to pick from. They or their families submitted about 25 each and a Canada Post panel selected from those. They're little snapshots of Canadian history, parts of the paper that stuck with people. They represent periods of time in people's memories. It's not an editorial or a long bit of text or a story. It's either a photograph or a cartoon that they remember. Each of the cartoonists was given a copy of their stamp. Aislinn's is of the 1972 Summit series against Russia. It's a piece he's proud of and he appreciates the honor. But he does say he sent Canada Post a letter with a complaint. It won't fit on an envelope. <laughs> Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Sophie Louis. Tonight's Your Canada is the clouds rolling in the sky above Lac La Biche, Alberta. Thanks for watching and I hope you'll join us again tomorrow.